Good morning to you all. Uh, this is Raman from ARC Audition Group, uh, starting the webinar on evolution from IoT to to data analytics to digital twins. So this is part of the Digital Transformation Council (DTC) Asia, and the duration for this webinar will be sixty minutes. The Digital Transformation Council is a place to connect and collaborate, learn and share with peers who are digitizing and transforming their organization. DTC is basically meant only for end-user community. The advantage is you can interact with the peer community of users. You can interact with your channels. You can log into this link and then see the benefit of being a DTC member. The agenda runs like this. I am Roman. Starting the welcome address, which will be about a minute or so. The topic introduction will be done by Bob Will, General Manager, Southeast Asia, ARC Advisor Group. He is based out of Singapore. We have a guest speaker today, Dr. Francisco, Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer, Main Leonard Water Services. After his presentation, there will be a panel discussion between Bob Will and Francis. Dr. Francisco. After the panel discussion, the session will be open for audience, and the entire duration will be about sixty minutes. Once they open up the discussions for Q and A, please put your questions in the Q and A chat box, and the moderator, namely Bob Will, will get through the questions and try to get the answers from the speaker. Now I'll request Bob Will to take over the topic introduction by our series Rico. Over to you, Morgan. Oh, oh, thank you very much, Raman, for that introduction. Uh, let me extend my own welcome to you all for this latest DTC Asia event from ARC Advisory Group. So over the last uh, two and a half years of these DTC Asia webinars, we have featured guest presenters from right across the industrial sector spectrum, automotive, aerospace, chemicals, electronics, oil and gas, power, to, to, name, to name a few of those industries. And that's given us a, a very good insight into the issues and also the digital opportunities across those different uh, industrial sectors. Today, today, for the first time, we have a speaker from the water industry, uh, a critical infrastructure sector, I'm sure you would agree. Indeed, across many parts of Asia, utilities are being challenged to ensure sufficient clean water supply to serve large and increasingly urbanized populations, as well as to effectively manage the processing of, of both domestic and industrial wastewater in the midst of uh, growing environmental concerns. So as, as Robert mentioned, I'm, I'm based here in Singapore, uh, where there are a number of water challenges, including the fact that uh, Singapore is not yet self-sufficient in water supply. It imports about 40% of, of its water. And, and water demand is set to double uh, here over the next 40 years. Another, another factor is climate change, uh, the climate change effects of more intense rainfall and longer dry spells, uh, they're already becoming apparent. So the National U Water Utility here has identified digitalization as a key enabler in optimizing its operational capabilities. Some of the key digital projects uh, within what it calls a smart roadmap include deployment of IoT sensors to provide online real-time visibility into the condition of its, of its water network, which eliminates the need for the previous uh, very labor-intensive manual checks and also enables the identification of water leaks uh, much, much faster than before. Uh, the utility is also trialing and deploying a number of new technologies, including uh, robots to augment uh, water facility security, augmented reality to enhance maintenance procedures, and an interesting one, interesting application of drones should be used to conduct unmanned inspection of the, of the integrity of sewerage tunnels which are built very deep underground. 
uh, it's, uh, it's quite incisive, uh, this quote from the CEO of the utility who, who said recently that digitalization gives us a huge opportunity to advance our mission in, in previously unimaginable ways. It is absolutely a game changer, is what he said. So, so with that from, from me uh, in the ARC office in downtown Singapore, let's go across to Manila in the Philippines to hear about digital developments at Mainly Lad Water Services from our guest speaker, Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer, Dr. Francisco Castillo. So it's over to you, uh, Francisco, thank you. Hello, thank you for that, Bob, uh, and uh, welcome. Um, uh, that's a good introduction. In fact, uh, I wanted to say that uh, normally, uh, the water industry is not typically seen as one of those in the forefront of uh, digital transformation. And, but today I will share what we've done through the years. And um, um, I'll, I'll start with, uh, with how we started all this and uh, share also as to where we are today. So I'm Francisco Castillo, or simply called Kiko, as many people call me. And um, the outline is first just a few words about my company. And then let me introduce very briefly what OT means. And uh, some of you may already be familiar with this. Um, one of the first things we did was the integration of IT and OT. And uh, related to that, we also implemented um, an IoT platform that was over 10 years ago. And um, that enabled us to do a lot of things. Um, more recently, uh, data analytics, uh, especially because you need a lot of data to be collected in order to do this. And I will, I will end although this is not really the end of our journey, but I will end at least this presentation with um, some of the more recent stuff that we did, which was the utilization, uh, pervasive utilization of digital twins, and then some conclusions. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Manila. So by the way, Manila is the old name of Manila. And uh, there are two water concessionaires in the Philippines, uh, sorry, in, in the metro Mani metropolitan Manila area, Manila water and Manila. So I just wanted to make that differentiation. But uh, Manila is actually the largest private water concessionaire. So we have a 25 year concession uh, given to us by the government. That means we are caretakers of government assets. So whatever we build, whatever we construct, maintain, repair, will eventually go back to the government. And we serve about 9 million people in the west zone of Metro Manila. That's where we operate. And the neighboring province of Cavite. So we provide, uh, this data is as of 2020, um, but we provide about 2.7 billion liters a day as well as septage and sewerage service with, with 600, over 600,000 kilometers of sewerage lines. We cover 540 square kilometers, which are uh, in which 17 cities and municipalities are within that area. Um, 12 years ago, when I joined Manila, we were actually servicing only um, less than half of this number of people. And, and, and we more than doubled, you know, uh, in a little over 10 years. So, you know, a lot of issues when, when the new management took over, but, um, you know, the first thing of course is infrastructure. We needed to do a lot of investments in terms of infrastructure, but, the question is, after those quick wins are finished, what's next? And this is where I think technology plays a crucial part. In terms of cost, it's, it's not much compared to all the civil works, mechanicals, and electrical investments that 
but it makes a whole lot of difference in terms of uh, bringing out efficiencies. So the first thing I'd like to discuss, uh, I won't discuss so much on IT, but mainly looking at the industrial side is what is operational technology? So OT, as it's commonly known, um, we can define it in many ways, but for us, it's really things like this. So this is a panel. This panel is sitting along the road, besides the road, and uh, it, it actually contains several things inside if we open it. It, it has a PLC, which is a, so to say, uh, industrial computer and uh, relays. You see here a drive. And what it does is it's an autonomous control system for pumps and valves. These pumps and valves are sitting below the surface. So there, there's a manhole here. And below that, this is what usually you have about three or four pumps and about six, eight valves and instruments. The idea here is that this, uh, this is what we call a booster station, is it will boost the pressure along a certain area in, in their network. So in order to be able to give sufficient supply. So this is normally operating autonomously. There's a program in it and it controls based on certain logic, what valves and pumps will go on, et cetera. Um, we, we, after we build these things, um, the next step was really to be able to have visibility. So we actually put a, a 3G or a, an LTE router, which allows us to um, continuously send the data and receive that and understand what's going on at the field. So this is an example of a relatively small facility. Similarly, we have big facilities. This is a water treatment plant. Um, and you can see here some of the beds. Um, and these are the filters. And similarly, this is also controlled by TCS and PLC systems, which are basically industrial computers that can work in hazardous conditions. And all of this is controlling all, all the equipment in the, in the plant. I mean, you have more than, you know, 1,000, typically more than 1,000 uh, electromechanical equipment, which turns on, off, um, you, you modulate the speed, the opening, right? Um, it's impossible nowadays to manually. It has to be done automatically. And again, this produces a lot of data status on the equipments, um, instruments, looking at the quality of the water, uh, the membranes, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, process indicators that are being captured. And similarly, you also uh, connect this so that we can actually monitor and control um, remotely. Another example, this is a sewage treatment plant. In fact, this particular sewage treatment plant is unmanned. And you can see here the, the quality of the water be, when it enters the plant and here as it goes out. So you can see the, the huge improvement. But what I'd like to uh, point out here is you can see the, the different instruments here. Um, these are, this is just a sample of the many instruments. So here, this is a flow meter. So it's measuring the flow of water that you're discharging. Um, we have also here a series of, of other instruments. Typically you have dissolved oxygen, pH, uh, chlorine uh, sensors, etc. So like what I'm trying to drive is that there are sensors and equipment all over the place. We have four, more than 400 plants and facilities everywhere. And we need to be able to monitor and collect all this information, which is a rich source of, of data. This is our central control room. And this is where all, all these over 400 facilities can be monitored and, and controlled. 
and we have here actually two teams working side by side. We have the water operations on the left and the sewerage operations on the right. And they're able to, to view. And of course, there's an autonomous control at each plant, but these people can override the default um, controls in case there's an upset or they need to take an action. Uh, seeing, for example, that in one area, the pressure has fallen. So maybe they can ramp up um, the supply from another area and divert it. Right. So that's really what, what they do. And, and that's all thanks to technology. So that's the OT side. But one of the big benefits is really being able to integrate that with IT. So my role, I started in 2011 as the CIO, and that was the traditional IT responsibilities. But there was a gray area during that time, especially when we constructed our most modern plant then. And uh, in 2014, I was also given the responsibilities for OT. So sometimes I get this question is, how, how did we break down the silos of IT and OT? And I always say, I, you know, I can't argue with myself because since I'm responsible for both, then we made that a reality. So this OT responsibilities really covers the design of the plant automation, as well as the instruments related to that as well as the operation and maintenance of all these automation systems. Very important is hackers don't differentiate whether it's an IT or an OT assets. And in the same way, what we established is a common view on IT security across all assets, whether those are IT assets, OT assets, it doesn't matter. We need to have a common view and a, a, uh, a hold of the entire uh, infrastructure that we have. So that is also my responsibility. As I mentioned, we have more than 400 plants all over. So how do we do this? Um, how did we integrate OT from with IT? So the, the most basic premise is to follow good practices. And this is a very old standard. It's called the Purdue model or also ANSI 95. And, uh, but this is really the basis for the work that we did. And what ANSI 95 uh, tells you is that you must separate by layers or by levels, different um, parts of your industrial and IT network starting with the sensors in the lowest level um, and then the second level the, the level one would be your control dcs plcs and then the SCADAS, uh at each plant and also the the control room which sits above this which be will be another level and um, between your OT, which is down here, and your IT, you actually should have an industrial um, demilitarized zone. Um, that means that you can't get from IT down here to the OT. Normally, what you need really is data coming from the industrial side to go up. So that's a unidirectional path that you allow. Nothing should go down. And uh, above this is the regular IT network. Uh, again, you have your DMZ before you connect to the internet. So this is your IT network. This is your OT or industrial control system network. And they are um, physically or logically isolated via um, the, that DMZ. So that's a best practice. 
The other good practice is, of course, segmenting your network, even within your industrial control uh, network um, by plants, for example. So you, you, you isolate uh, for the mere fact that if something gets goes wrong in one plant, um, you don't want that to spread. And so you, you do a segmentation horizontally, but also vertically, and you put different protections at each layer as well as across different plants. So that, that's the best basic premise. And as I mentioned, normally what we need is information going up. The raw data comes from here below, but management really needs to understand what is going on at an upper level. So that's what we call our Internet of Things. Our Internet of Things is really the communication not between humans and machines, but between devices. So we are collecting all this information, all this data below. Now we got to push it up and make sense out of it. So that means machine to machine communication in order to monitor, control, store, and eventually analyze that data. Now, the, the other aspect to this is that, as you can imagine, we have very big plants, we have small plants, how, how does the communication done? So this is actually multimodal. We have fiber, op, fiber uh, optic cables for uh, the larger facilities, uh, lease lines, um, I mentioned 3G or LTE, right? Um, and even SMS, you know, for some very small facilities, SMS is being used to transmit data across. So it's a best of breed approach, both in terms of comms, as well as the different softwares and hardware. No single vendor as of today can provide an end-to-end -end, um, approach to to achieving this. So we have several components, right? We have the sensors, we have the edge hardware to capture the data at the edge and convert it into digital form. We have the comms, and then we also have a central storage. That central storage is, is really the heart of the IoT architecture. It's getting all this data throwing it into this central repository, which now becomes our main source of technical data. And then of course, getting that data and being able to do reports and being able to do analytics. So this is a simplified diagram of how it works. You have the different devices, pumps, motors, valves, you have the sensors, you have your PLCs and all of that, they're all throwing data on a regular basis, sometimes um, milliseconds, sometimes seconds, right? And you put it in this um, IoT repository. From here, you can do all this reports, analysis, and very important, you can also use that to feed other applications that may need technical data. So that means that now you this becomes your single source of truth where all technical data that is needed is stored there. It's, it's in clean form, which is very important in order to do any analysis. And from there, you can now feed it to all the different systems that may need it. This is an example of, of some sensors. For example, we place um, vibration sensors on uh, motor pump assemblies. This can give you a lot of information, especially for preventive maintenance. Um, if there's certain vibration occurring, you can actually preempt the equipment from breaking and you can take action. Um, by putting many different vibration sensors in different axes, you can what is the problem. Is it a problem that the equipment is not well anchored? Is it because it's not aligned? Does it lack lubrication? Or is the bearing about to break, right? You can do a complex analysis. 
Here's another example. This is a flow meter measuring the flow along this pipe. Uh, for example, for dosing, um, what do you call this, uh, chemicals or measuring the, the temperature on this vent and so forth, right? You, we have so many types of sensors, um, even uh, chemical sensors to analyze the chemistry of components. Um, so all this goes into that repository and we can store that data for years, even, even at the second level, even you have a one second resolution, you can actually store that. Um, and that becomes really your single repository of technical data. Uh, as I mentioned, you can do reports, right? But beyond reports, you can do analytics and you can use that data to feed other applications that may need it. Um, I'll show you a demo of what, uh, how our IoT platform looks like. Um, and this, um, I, I hope you're seeing this. This is a video. This shows the different IOT screens that we've developed. And I will show you a sample. So if we get, this is the pressure along a pipe and we can see here in the last 14 days, the profile and the current pressure. And this is all dynamic. We can change, for example, the scale, change it to one day. And we can see now how this has changed for one day. And we can actually double click on it and get a more detailed view. We can actually measure the, and the scale of it, et cetera, right? Um, another example, this is on a plant. So this is a plant and this is almost real time information. You can see the status of several pumps, critical pumps, critical equipment, whether it's running or not, whether it's stopped. Uh, these are filters here. We can see the pressure on the filter. We can also see the differential pressure. Differential pressure on a filter typically tells you whether the filter needs cleaning because it's clogged, right? The higher the potential. Um, we can see different pressures on different parts of the plant and the level of reservoir. And again, you double click on each of the, any of these, and you get a detailed view, like I showed earlier, like this. So this is the level of the reservoir last one day, or I can change it for 14 days and I can see the trend, right? And then last, just another example. Um, I can show you, this is the level of the water in the dam. You can see here, there's been a glitch. So this indicates that the instrument had a misreading, right? Uh, but on normal readings, you can, you can see the trend and you can contrast that with previous year's data. I took this video about a month ago. Uh, today, in the last three weeks, we've had a lot of typhoons. The, the water level has actually increased by 10 meters so dramatically. And, um, so that's not reflected there yet. But that's the idea. I know we can actually see all this information um, through our IoT platform. And again, this IoT platform is not connected at the industrial level. It's on top. So this is also a secure way of getting and analyzing all this information without actually going down and uh, into the facility, right? So it's more secure. So as I mentioned, we started this over 10 years ago, even before IoT was a buzzword. And um, what this has enabled us is because of, we've been getting data for a long time, we can now actually do more analytics. Anything that involves uh, machine learning or AI really requires a lot of data. And that is precisely the point. As you will see in my examples later on, all analytics 
um, requires uh, in at least the analytic problems that we have been looking at requires very good weather information. And um, what we did is we actually put up automatic weather stations. So they look like this uh, and we put them in critical points. So you can see here, there's a rain gauge. You have an anemometer. We also have a wind vane, and this is powered by a solar panel because these are in isolated areas. So there's no electricity. And this captures all this information and it also has a satellite communication um, transmitter, which transmits the data every hour. So in the same way, we collect that data, we put it into our IoT platform. So it's just another data source. We also feed it to uh, a weather provider, which um, using their analytics, does a prediction of the weather. So uh, we, we contract them as a service and we get something like this. So for example, this is the 14 day rainfall prediction cumulative in the Angat catchment area. So this is where we get most of the water um, that supplies Metro Manila. So um, how do they do this? Uh, without going into too technical um, details, not only are they using our, our weather stations, but this uh, company also has weather information from the National uh, Weather Bureau, as well as other partners, which allow them to do a better prediction of weather. So this serves for a lot of purposes. For example, these are two, two examples of data analytics um, problems that we've developed. Um, being able to forecast the rainfall. So the first thing about rainfall is, of course, it has a direct effect on the level of our dams, obviously. But it also has an effect on turbidity. So this is the normal water condition in a dam that we have. And sometimes we have, maybe once, twice a year, we have extreme turbidity events such as this. So you can see water turned virtually into chocolate color. And it's not so easy to predict that turbidity because it, when it rains a lot, um, the soil is able to absorb the water. But if it rains excessively, what happens is the soil starts to erode and goes into our catchment. So we, given that weather information, the idea is now to be able to forecast episodes of high turbidity and prepare the plant downstream with our correct chemicals, with a correct uh, a scheme in order to handle those extreme events. Another example is predicting the water level in our reservoir. So this picture here on the right is actually our biggest reservoir. So you don't see anything, you just see grass because actually the reservoir is below it. And this is in the middle of Metro Manila and yet it looks as if it's in, a, in the countryside. So that the reservoir that is sitting down here supplies 80% of the water to Metro Manila. So it's very critical that we maintain a level too, not too high because it causes a lot of losses, and not too low because otherwise not enough pressure reaches them. So there's a very narrow band. So the idea here is to be able to predict and let the operators act accordingly by predicting the level. How do we do that? It's of course, intake minus outtake is the, the difference in level. But um, in order to do that prediction, what we need is of course, water production, which in turn, uh, is affected by the weather conditions and demand is also affected by weather. Uh, usually when it rains, um, the, the consumption goes down. People don't water their garden, etc. right? So we need to be able to do an, 
uh, not a real time, but a day ahead prediction of the level of the water. And also we do a seven day ahead. So it's a moving prediction as every hour goes along, it re-predicts what the level of, of the reservoir will be and the, the operations can adjust accordingly. Uh, and this is just a little bit more detail on the machine learning model that we've used. Um, it's basically a water balance with inputs from both the, the production as well as the consumption side. The last thing I wanted to share with you is the concept of the digital twin. So what is a digital twin? It's, it's really a replica of our physical plant. And the idea is to be able to model or emulate the plant um, with the process. It, it, plants nowadays have a very complicated biochemical process, but they're all automated. So before we even go to the plant, we can try out the control program on the emulator and thresh out any bugs. The experience has been that we can actually thresh out nine, more than 99% of bugs so that when we actually uh, plug this into the actual physical plant, there's very little um, changes that we need to do. And so the benefits are huge. And we started this uh, several years ago, but this really got accelerated during the pandemic because we were limited in terms of how much we could go out to the field. Today, we use digital twins for all plants. We don't go to the field unless it has passed this testing. And it can also be used, of course, as a risk reduction mechanism but also as a ch change management tool. If there's changes you want to do to the plant, you can actually simulate it before you actually do it. And last, it can also be used as a training for the operators. So con as conclusions, first, you know, uh, for us, data processing is really geographically distributed. We have plants all over. Um, and for us, IoT has provided a lot of benefits, reports, analytics, right? Being able to do forecasts. And um, it's also a very secure way to access plant information because you don't access the plant itself, which always has risks in terms of security. You're accessing a replica, right? And you can do all the analysis that you want there. And today, virtual commissioning is for us a reality, right? Uh, last but not least, uh, Fearless Plugin. Um, I'm the author of this book. It's called Managing Information Technology, published in, in Germany by Springer. And it doesn't talk about technology, it talks about who, how to manage it. Um, it's also available on Amazon, if you're interested. And with that, thank you very much. Maraming salamat po. And if there are any questions, I'd be glad to take them. All right. Th th thank you very much uh, for that presentation. Oh, I can't right. hear you. I don't know why. C can you hear me now, Francisco? If it's... Hello, Francisco. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Hello, You're Francisco? having an audio problem. Oh. Uh, Bob, do, do you wanna, Bob, I'll, I'll re-log it. Able to hear you. Yeah, able to yeah. Hear you. Okay. I'll re-log yeah. it. Okay, okay. We'll just wait a couple of minutes for you, for you Francisco. But yes, uh, uh, if you do, uh, I hope that you do have some questions for our speaker today, then do please type those into the Q&A box, which you'll see towards the bottom of your screen, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take those and we'll ask those to to Francisco, our, our guest speaker today from Mainland Water Services in, in the Philippines. Before we go to the audience, let me ask a couple of, couple of my own questions which occurred to me as we as you were talking. You, you mentioned that you started this uh, initiative around 10 years ago, and, and you specifically said before IoT became a buzzword. So, so yeah. what, what, were the key, what were the key drivers that 
that made you look into IoT technology at the time that you thought it could be it could be useful for for your your, your utility? Okay, uh, good question. So uh, I'll just give you an example, right? I, I one of my initial slides was the very small facility which showed um you know it, the it's a booster station um imagine that that facility which we have so many all over metro manila the way that it was um handled before was there was a roving team going around and actually going there and, and turning on the settings right and and they would go probably back maybe in a few days so you don't even know what's happening on the field right so imagine from there to now having full visibility as to what is happening at each site so that was a very big improvement right same for the pressure i showed you in in, in the pipe it used to be a roving team that would collect the data every two weeks and so after two weeks yet that data becomes out right there's very little you can act upon if you get it late right if mm. you have a breakage for example the pressure falls and you'll you'll find out two weeks later right so there there are mm. benefits across many many areas yeah right right you, you also mentioned that originally you were in charge of IT, then you expand, you're asked to expand the scope to OT, and I was volunteered for that. You were volunteered, volunteered, <laughs> volunteered for that, and and, and but I, I, know, I know you said that you know because you're in charge that the 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 IT OT issue was not a, was not so much a problem. But I, I would guess that that you were you did face some challenges. In that you know you you had a you had mm -hmm. to integrate in some fashion the IT OT teams that, that may have and would have yeah. different objectives and, uh, yeah. and, and, and responsibilities. So did you have a way of going about that? Yeah, an another good question. Actually, um, they are separate teams. They they are different uh, different domain expertise. You know? uh, I was fortunate enough that I worked at the plant doing OT. 25 years ago, right? No, not 25 years ago, but maybe, well, yeah, around around 20 plus years ago. So I, I was familiar mm. with it. Right? Now, the challenge really was making these two teams talk to each other. Yeah, because traditionally, they just want to do it themselves, right? So I'll just give you an example. As you've seen, we have a lot of network devices. We have a, a huge network, both in the IT and the OT. And sometimes the tendency is, I'll do it myself, right? But no, you can achieve a lot of synergies across, and especially because there are certain components which are in a gray area in terms of, um, you know, it will affect both IT and OT. So that is really the, the, the challenge, the mindset to say, no, you have to collaborate. You can't do it yourself, right? Or another concrete example is um, workstations, right? Um, workstations for, for a plant, which has a SCADA, are set up differently. But for me, it's the same mm -hmm. team that sets up a workstation for IT and for OT. Different configurations, different baseline, but it's the same team because that, that really drives a lot of efficiencies. So right. the OT team has to understand that they need to drive the specs, but the actual execution may be with somebody else, right? So those are the kind of challenges. Right, right, okay. I, I see, okay, let's get, let's get to this question from one of our audience members. And um, he's asking, how is DCS uh, or PLC data being historized securely in the database? Is it being historized along with the IoT data? Oh, sorry, I, I, I don't see that question. Oh. It's in the Q&A Q box from Swapnil. Okay. Q&A box. He's asking about uh, whether the DCS, the control system data, is, is being historized along with the uh, uh, IoT data. Okay, okay. That's a good question. So the... 
the DCS data has its own historian, so to speak, right? And that data can be a source of data for the IoT. So you have, uh, let, uh, of course, I, I simplified the diagram, but there's a lot of data that may be needed at the plant. But you don't need everything in the repository. So some of the, re the data that sits in your DCS repository may be captured and put into that central IoT platform, but not necessarily all, right? So you, you have a hierarchy of, of, of data and sources of data until you reach that central IoT platform. I hope that answers your right. question. Okay. And a question here about the digital twin solution. How long did it take to create the digital twin and deploy that solution? It really depends on the on the plant because it, it's on a plant by plant basis. So you have a small plant and that can go fast. But if you have a water treatment plant with, uh, you know, uh, tens of thousands of devices and it could go over a year right who mm. constructs that digital twin normally we contract it we don't do it ourselves so the people that are building the dcs need to put in those specs into the digital twin but when we do the testing it, it's done uh, jointly the other thing that we've done in order to accelerate this process is there are certain facilities which are very repetitive. I showed you the, the booster, which is a small facility. We have reservoirs with pumps, pumping stations. We have, uh, for sewage, we have lift stations. Those are very repetitive. The only difference is how many pumps, how many valves, but the design is very much similar. So we actually mm. templated that so that it becomes easier. Yeah. Mm, okay. Okay. A related question to that is someone is asking, can you expand upon the virtual commissioning aspect of, uh, of, of the project and your experience of virtual commissioning? Um, okay. I don't know how to expand. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it, it, it's, I just say, for example, during the pandemic, which is a good example of this, uh, we were doing the virtual uh, commissioning and physically nobody was in the same place. So we had the, my engineers in one location, we had the contractor in another location, we had the process people and operations in another location, and we all logged in. In this case, it was using uh, Zoom or, or Teams, into a into the 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 digital twin and conducted the the testing there you know and all of this was hmm. people sitting in their house or, or you know because during the pandemic we couldn't move i mean the philippines was one of those countries which was really really the government really restricted movement right so hmm. that that's an example of how how it was done right mm. okay okay uh one of our audience members has uh clearly recognized that you're using siemens technology uh, quite extensively uh, in your utility here and the question he's asking is uh are you using simit which is siemens simulation technology with a with a variety of plc plcs or is it only being used for the pcs or being only being used for pcs7 well that's a very detailed question. We use Cement mm -hmm. only for Siemens, PCS7, uh, yeah, PLCs, right? Um, and then for DCS, there's an equivalent. So it depends on the PLC brand that you use, right? Um, the reality also is that even for the digital twin, you're also in a way restricted to the vendor of the PLC and the DCS system. Today, that's that's a limitation. I suppose in the future, well, actually, it's it's starting to to um, to change. But as of today, that's the easiest way. Uh, you you stick to the vendor of the DCS or the PLC because it makes it more seamless in terms of of testing. Hmm. 
Okay, okay. This, uh, uh, this and by the way, a, maybe yeah. maybe I'll just add. Yeah, sure. One, this is not this is not a digital twin or IoT or anything. But one of the things that we did is we tried to standardize on a few brands of PLCs. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because then you have economies of scale. You have more leverage with the vendors, right? So we we have a few brands only, only a few. So at least there's competition, but you also want to um, be able to easily, you know, uh, mm. learn the technology so you don't have, you know, so many brands that you need to manage. Yeah. Right, right, okay, okay, makes sense. Um, this, this question is about, um, can you talk about whether you had collaboration with the government administration? And whether your IT, IT OT analytics is being used for planning and policy making at that, that level. Okay. Well, we don't have collaboration in the sense that you know we 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 do this together with the government. But one thing that we have done and uh, is we've given access to our IoT platform to the regulator because they are constantly asking for information with regards right. to availability of water pressure of water, maintenance, right? So by giving them access, they can actually see it. And they, they use it a lot. In fact, when they see a disruption, you know, they call us and, and say, hey, what's happening, right? So that, that's the extent of what we've done, yeah. Okay, okay. And an, another question is about the, um, your, about, about the IoT phase. So you were, you were an earlier, adopter of IoT. So what was your experience with the reliability of the IoT ecosystem, especially across the uh, urban and rural areas of your uh, concessionaire? I, I didn't get you. Actually, I don't yeah, he's, asking, he's asking, asking about the, uh, the reliability of, of your IoT ecosystem. Reliability? Yeah, across across the okay. concessionaire. Okay, the well, sensors, it, it, sensors it, the network, yeah. yeah. Actually, it really depends on the comms and the communications. So right. I would say that when we started, the reliability was quite low. But okay. as the as the telcos invested more, we we experienced really a dramatic uptick, and, and especially with the wireless. Uh, All right now. Mm -hmm. Most of these wireless routers also have the capability of redundancy. So you can put two different SIM cards at least. So if one goes mm -hmm. down, the other switches over. So initially in that, but today we don't see the necessity because the reliability is quite good. Yeah, so it has okay. improved. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, okay. So, so using cellular- If you, if you want a, a figure, I would say it's 99.9% .9 of the time up, I would say. Yeah. And that's based on cellular network technology. Cellular, you're using yeah. from cellular, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, another uh, audience is asking whether you're using drones or robotics to detect leakage from distribution mm. pipings, and do do you collect that kind of data as well? Well, we don't use drones for that purpose. I think we use drones to do aerial surveys, but that's it. Uh, robots. Uh, depends on the definition of a robot, but right. we do have some devices that are semi-autonomous and they go into the pipe and uh, look for leaks. Uh, and in, in that area, in terms of leaks management, there are a lot of technologies that, that we use. I'm not the best person to ask because we have a, yeah. another department that is specialized mm. just on leaks and leak detection. But I do okay. know that we do have uh, those kind of devices, and and they they have different technologies depending on the type of pipe, depending on the material, because not not everything can be. Yep. Right. Right. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, uh, when you started your your IoT project, did you already have data analytics in mind uh, that? The, that you could incorporate data analytics, or was it really a was that really a consequence of realizing, hey, you know, I've got all this data now. Now I can do enhanced analytics. Well, which way around did it go? Well, I would say, to be honest, it's more of the latter. 
Yeah. Okay. So you realize, hey, we got this data. Now we can. Yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, because it's a lot of data, and you need a lot of clean data. So yeah. okay. actually, that's my advice for people looking into data analytics. It's, I mean, I've, I've really summarized it there, but I could talk on and on about data analytics and uh, mm. see everybody's talking about data scientists and all that. Um, but our experience is that yes data scientists are are important right but the domain knowledge is even more so you need to involve the mm. people that really know what is happening the, the engineers that know how to interpret the data and all that and what really okay. is a lot of in what is really time consuming is the mm. cleansing of the data okay mm. so just to give you an idea we took over one year to clean data and the, the data scientists took two months just to develop the model, right? I mean, okay. so, and mm -hmm. the guys who clean up the data are the data domain experts, right? I, I mean, I'll give you an example mm -hmm. I showed you earlier, right? You have an instrument and it conks out and gives you bad data. So what do you do? So the first thing is you gotta detect what data is bad. If it's an outlier, what do you do? Do you remove it from your data set? Do you interpolate? Do you, you know, do you take a proxy for that data that is missing? So these are decisions that really mm. are the engineers. It's not even IT, it's it's not even myself. They need, they know what data is good, how it works, and they can actually suggest the best way to clean that data and to estimate it if needed. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is and what will probably be the probably be the final question is it's really about um the performance of, of the project as a whole. So did you did you what kind of metrics did you use to assess that uh, the overall performance of, of of these projects and was there any, you know, did you evaluate financial returns, for example? ROI. Um well, you know, the, the challenge with technologies, it's it's always very hard to translate to financial returns all the time. Uh, and in fact, even though I talk about this as one big project, it's actually many smaller projects, many, many different projects. So I could say that for some of these projects, there were metrics involved. Some of them, not at all. It's a leap okay. of faith and, and, and really management trusting that, you know, this, this makes sense. Like, I, I'll just give an example. I mean, building our central control room and being able to monitor everything. Um, I mean, it, it's very hard to get a, a return on investment on that. But if, if you know, it, it makes sense because if you have an interruption or you have a or you have a an upset somewhere, your ability, your agility to do something. I, I don't know how to translate that into dollar value, but right. that's sure. what happened. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. I, uh, with that, I, I'm being asked to to close the Q and A session. And yeah, for, for, for me, let, let me give my own thanks to to you, Francisco. Yeah. Um, if there's more I, questions, yeah. Just yeah. Just uh, contact me through LinkedIn, you know, just Google me, I mean, search me. Uh, for yeah, this and I, I, yeah, and someone, someone is also asking the, the name of your book again? The yeah, it's called book? Managing is Information it? Technology. Okay, go, go and check that book out. I'm sure it'll be a good, a good, a good read. Uh, let me hand back to my ARC colleague uh, to, to, to close the session. Uh, Lena or Raman? Yes, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Oh, okay, and, uh, yeah. uh, thanks, Dr. Francisco. The presentation yep. was very so, excellent. And you have given also... answers to all the questions. Uh, so we have an upcoming and past events. So uh, Digital uh, D Transformation Council DTC Asia Online has been scheduled on 24th August, the next event. And uh, current event, uh, we have Asia session videos are uh, available online, which is streaming from August 1st, and it will be available till August 31st. So both India event and Tokyo event, which has been uh, 
uh, completed on 12th and 13th July and 20th June. This session videos are being uploaded on VPADS and it has been available. So you all can uh, visit the website and uh, you all can view the videos also. So we have an upcoming uh, event from US America. The 28th annual ERC Industry Leadership Program is scheduled from February 5th to 8th, 2024, Orlando, Florida. And Europe Forum dates will be announced soon. And our Asia Forum for the next year, 2024, will be announced soon. So we would like to thank Dr. Francisco Castillo, Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer, Manilad Water Services, for participating in this DTC Asia webinar. We thank Bob Gill, General Manager, ARC Advisory Group, for moderating the webinar. We also like to thank all the delegates for participating in this webinar. Finally, we thank ARC Advisory Group India team for all the logistics support. Thank you all once again.